So while um, we were talking there, it takes about uh, five minutes for a single one block node to power up and actually show up on the network. So what you see on, this, on my screen here, and I do have a Windows VM running as well, but here on my Mac, on the, the two right hand finder views are my local files. And I've just got a bunch of video files here um, on, my, uh, on my Mac on the right hand side. And then I also have uh, on the left hand side, just a network view here, and this is the one blocks 0069 that came up. And so every one blocks that ships, as soon as it's powered on, in less than five minutes, there's a public share that's available for read write access for anybody on that network. With zero configuration, it's done. I didn't enter in any IP addresses, DNS, usernames, anything. Literally just saw the share from the one blocks node, and I can immediately begin to just drag and drop files to that node. This left hand view down the lower left is for the same node, but if you notice, there's a snapshot folder here, right? This snapshot folder is accessible by all users, and if in restricted shares, you know, if you have an engineering share, engineering has access to that snapshot folder. In the public share, everybody does. And you can see users can actually navigate the snapshot folder by date or by the most recent. And so if you expand the most recent view, when I copy this over, you see there's a whole bunch of different points in time, and we're taking snapshots for the continuous data protection model. And if you open up one of those, you can actually just simply navigate to the same share, but what you'll see is some of the files are actually written, and I can actually read them directly out of snapshots so I can compare which version of the file I want to recover if I don't know exactly what time or day or month. At the same time, you see a bunch of them that are grayed out. Right? This is the metadata discussion that we're having before we actually write the files to the actual uh, hard drives. So if I navigate back out here to kind of the last point in time that I've taken a snapshot, which is the last write, I now have my video of Christopher Walken in Weapon of Choice. Right? Now what I can do is show you how easy it is to actually recover a snapshot where I have another Weapon of Choice video on my Mac I colored, uh, colored the file red, just so visual. And this is actually um, the Steve Jobs file, right? It's a video, two different files, exact same file name. And so I know it's a stretch, but files actually do get overwritten, right? And so if a user actually accidentally does that, I now have my Steve Jobs version that's on my one blocks that I now want to go back to a previous version of that file and recover it back to Christopher Walken, right? So literally now, in the snapshot folder, and you can, again, snap and browse by time or date, I now just create a copy of that and paste it back to any directory that I want to. In this case, I'm just going to go back to the original directory and replace the old file that I did not intend to write with the correct one that I actually want. And so now, back in the primary volume, primary share on one blocks, I now have Christopher Walken back up and dancing. Right. So this is one of the things that comes out of us managing the objects at, every, uh, at, a, at a granular level there. The other thing that comes out of this is the ability to deduplicate uh, files. So I'm going to copy over just a couple hundred meg uh, video file here. And this is actually uh, one of our files that, uh, uh, how to videos on how to use uh, one system, right? And so what we're going to do here is I want to show you what the deduplication looks like. So if you take a, uh, just a space snapshot of what we're looking here, you can see there's only 1.771 gig on disk. Now if I create, and I just copied over this file here, if I just change the file name, so now I'm going to have the exact same file with two different file names, and again I'm going to copy it over to my public share, what we'll see from a finder perspective is actually both versions of the file, because you have both names of the file. From a user perspective it's different, but underlying that it's actually the same. Now if I transition here over into Windows, and I refresh my network view, I also see one blocks 0069 on the network. And I can do the exact same thing and navigate to the public share. And here I have both of my getting started with one system videos as well as my Christopher Walken uh, dancing video. Right? So whether you have uh, Mac or Linux or Windows, you have access to the same files. And you haven't integrated the snapshots into the Windows previous versions API yet? We haven't done that yet. Right now you can browse through, you can browse through the snapshots 
says the Apple fanboy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your mouth out. <laughs> uh, so now. Allow me to say, yes, it is a pain. So now I actually just took a uh, git info on the same folder, the same public folder, and it's the exact same 1.771 gigabytes. So even though both videos are accessible with the two different file names, since they're the exact same file, we only store one copy on one block. Right? So here's the original one, and then the version two is where I just played a moment ago. Okay. Now, all that was done without ever registering an account with one system. So what I did already is I just created a, an account for myself, just username, company name, and password, and then I get a confirmation email. Once I click on that email, my account is now activated, so I can actually log into one system. And here, I said we set up a tech field day one system account, but normally it's just one system.exablocks.com, and everybody uses the exact same system. Now, what we did here is we wanted to make sure that we used a two-factor authentication method for people that say they should be managing the storage with who and what one blocks they should be managing out on premises. And so we used and took the concept of Bluetooth pairing. And so now, with my one system account that you see here, I'm going to actually discover the rings that my local Mac is on to be able to discern, should I be managing that one blocks? And so as soon as one blocks is connected with Ethernet to the internet, it's already communicating with one system. So we're discovering all of the one blocks on the, no, on the network across all different companies. And so now I'm going to actually discover the same one blocks that I, my Mac is on the same network of. And so now here, for those up at the front, you can uh, see you've got a. You that? We have uh, an agent software, one system agent running on one blocks that's communicating with one system up in the cloud. And now we have a pairing process of a five digit code of 23380 that's generated here. Then now I want to enter that. That pairing code from one blocks on premises coordinates with one system in the cloud, and now I can begin administering and managing that one blocks. Right? Well, you have to look at the display. It's not available anywhere else. If you're local to the display, you can discern and read those five digits. If you're not local, you can enter in the public IP address that is displayed on the LCD of one blocks to register it remotely. Yeah, but if I have to look at the at the LCD to see the IP address, I could not, might as well see the five-digit code. Uh, or if, if somebody else is there, um, you know, you, mm. you can you can ping it. You can get access to the IP address in different ways, even yeah. if you're not able to read the LCD. And it, 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 it obtain a DHCP piece, right? Mm. So you're yep. probably, and if you're running DHCP, you're probably specifying the MAC address. Assuming the company that runs this equipment allows it to use DHCP right. or, or yeah. whatever. So now you can actually just begin to do some of the simple management and accessing the files either Windows, Linux, uh, or Mac. And so you can see my ring here, and I can begin to change, uh, you know, some of the attributes of some of the default fields, right? And we can go with just uh, tech field day bacon here, just for thing. And so now, exactly. So here we just have a really simple interface. Provide some of the necessary information in terms of file system space and utilization. Here's my one blocks, right? And you can see there are five open slots on my ring, so I can see how many nodes are actually joined in my ring. And if I drill down into the actual one blocks, I can see that I've got three drives of the eight populated. And I can actually see that this is a terabyte drive, this is a 500 gig drive, and this is another terabyte, right? And there's my two and a half terabytes that I'm seeing here. This is also where you can perform the remote upgrade of software, so the next version of one blocks. You see here the software is up to date. You'll be noted if you want to take an action of either rebooting the node or updating software remotely through one system, and it'll actually take place uh, with that. So now on the share side, this is one of the things that, uh, Howard, you were just asking about. This is what we can do to create a, a share of you know, tech field day, and I can add you know, any description I would like to, and I can set different attributes to the shares. <coughs> Anybody on the network has access to that share, read-write access, or I can restrict it to only users that are registered with a one system account can have access to it, or I can actually set or restrict it of individual users. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that just for myself here. And now I can just click save, and that's one, in, one way to create a share and allocate a user permission. Yes? This might have been asked already. Um, Active Directory integration? Your money will be coming in just a moment because that's the next step. Oh, okay. Um, 
once you start to do integration with users and, and permissions, you could, we can handle that within one system if a company would like to, or if they have Active Directory, they can actually That's click here into Active Directory and import their usernames and permissions that way and allocate either groups or users. And so here, if I want to create a, another user, and I'm just going to create a, uh, just a disposable email, and I can give, again, access to different users, different read-write levels of permission to that user. So now this new user that I created, you'll see here in just a minute that, again, we'll use that same method of sending an email confirmation that that user has to click on that authenticates them as a person, and then they have access to one system. And so now you see this one that I just created is still pending compared to my account, which is active, because I've already act, uh, activated that login. So now if I jump over here back to um, my network, I can actually see on the network one block 0069. And now I'm actually able to see the two different shares that are available, public and tech field. And since I'm registered as guests, I won't be able to actually um, access the restricted share. And same thing on Windows. If you go back to Windows and navigate down into one block 0069, you can do that as well. So now, one of the things that, that we're able to do with the method that Tad is talking about in terms of how we handle hashing and, and managing objects and auto-discovering, when you add a second one blocks, that's going to add additional capacity to the ring. You can add additional capacity to the ring by adding an individual drive to a node or another node into the entire ring. And you, you can mix them at any point you want, right? The smallest starting point is a single one blocks with th three disk drives. And you can grow initially up to six nodes in a single ring. And with 48 disk drives at four terabytes, you're looking at 192 terabytes of raw capacity. The minimum arrangement is one disk. You yes. You can buy one disk. One disk. Any capacity, SATA, SAS, uh, any manufacturer mix and match within a node, mix and match across nodes in a given ring. And so now what ha is happening here is the second node is coming up, and it'll come up in about two, three minutes. The same thing is happening in terms of it's discovering and looking on the network for other one blocks. Once it sees the other one blocks, it'll automatically join that same global namespace that the first one blocks created, and you'll just have an increase in, an increase in capacity for the entire ring. Okay, Sean, we got a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay. So, that's a, so it's one system that's talking to my Active Directory, right? Yes. So I have to punch a hole through my firewall to allow no, access to a domain no, controller from no. the internet? No. 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 <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, Good, because we didn't like that idea. So <laughs> the solution is that uh, in, order, in order to register the one blocks ring with, with your Active Directory server, this is the only step during which we need the Active Directory information. Post that step, then the, the one blocks is talk directly to the Active Directory server in order to do the authentication. As one system, we don't know anything about any of your users. The only piece of information that we need in order to actually do that is we need to be able to actually create register the one blocks with your Active Directory. So you're right? actually joining these to the domain? Yes. So this Active Directory config, it's simply the, uh, the AD admin username and password in order to do the join. It's, it's the piece that you need in order to do the join. Now, in order to keep that safe, in the cloud, we don't know your Active Directory password. What we do is we use browser-based encryption in order to encrypt it in your browser when you type it in. It moves through the cloud in its encrypted form. It's encrypted using a public and private key pair. The public key is a one-time use key that comes from the OneBlocks device. So when you go to that tab and you say enable Active Directory, the OneBlocks device, which in order to actually register itself, has to have your password. Uh, <coughs> but the goal is to transmit that password so it's, one system nev can never know it. So it's impossible for an attacker to get it. Uh, they would have to actually hack into the one blocks, and that's the same as any other you registration. Really do love your crypto, <laughs> we love crypto. I mean, <laughs> crypto really solves a whole bunch of problems. So. Yeah. Um, I may have to give my money back. Uh, on the one system interface on the website, are you able to browse data? Today, no. Okay. Uh, and that is so, one of the features on the roadmap that. that customers are asking us for. Uh, but maybe I'll let Sean talk about that. I one. just have the compliance. Yeah questions yeah. at that point, like, 
how do we verify that our information is not being accessed by people who, you know, aren't us, if it's accessible right. over the uh, interface? Yeah, and I think that, that's one of the things we're looking at in terms of using the user credentials uh, to be able to access it just as if you were on a restricted share on the network. You have to monitor that and you know, log it and be able to uh, yeah, well, provide adequate information based upon that question, right? I mean, who's okay, So you're never it? planning on storing anything other than the metadata about the nodes themselves? That's basically. right. Correct. Think about just the, the yeah. management services running there and an access method to the information that's on the customer premises. You, you can think of one system in that case as essentially a proxy to get the browser back into the into the. Which is just screen. why mentally I still haven't reconciled the fact that it needs to live in the cloud. I mean, I understand what you're doing and I understand why yeah. and the, the central availability and all that. I really do. I just like it. I, I see the path of all the the credentials that are just going back to the the, the systems themselves, and I'm, it just seems. So, so, a, so AD does have a model for dealing with this, AD Federation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, it's, it's companies are actually starting to use it and starting to integrate it. Um, the end goal, of course, is single sign-on, right, for all the resources in your organization. And more and more organizations are moving to more and more cloud services for email, for, you know, uh, project tracking, for blah, 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 all this stuff. Um, in that sense, you know, that, that whole single sign-on problem is a set of problems that other people are working really, really hard to solve. And we get to ride along on that curve uh, from the storage aspect, because we're the guys that are thinking about how to integrate that in the storage. Sure, but, but in those cases, I think most of the resources that you're accessing are also on the cloud, right? Like Office 365, stuff like that, which are, you know, providing really nice integration. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, so, I, it's not like a, a, an end game, like, okay, this sucks now, even though I yeah. really loved it before. It's more like, I just, you know. So I, I think in some aspects, <laughs> old in some ways. The, the way to look at it is we're looking about, we're looking at folks that have more than a one or two terabyte size storage problem. I would agree that for small size storage problems, the cloud is becoming maybe, you know, extremely well accepted and maybe the primary storage location for you have one or two terabytes. But if you have 200 terabytes and you're paying 1,200 bucks per year per terabyte to store it in S3, and you're a smaller medium business, that bill is absolutely enormous for you. And there's no way you're gonna put 90% of your data up there. Uh, you're gonna, you wanna put the hot data, the 10% the, the of your data that's really you know, super, super, super critical, that's the stuff that'll end up in the cloud in that model. Whereas, you know, 90%, like all those log files that you need to collect because you have to data mine them next year, you don't want to store those in Amazon S3 at 200 bucks a year. The data that's not making you money. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. And so I'm going to leave the screenshot up. The, the second node is joining. And what you'll see here, there's a bad disk in here, potentially. Right? So we determine what's going on with the disk drive. And what you'll see over time is just, yeah. you'll see a red light. Right? So you can see visually which drive is dead. You'll also see that within one system uh, in, the, in the node view. You'll also see it transition to the file system is rebalancing. And so there'll be a yellow state for the nodes until the rebalancing and that movement of the objects, one copy of the objects, excuse me, one copy of the first three objects on node 0069 is moved over to 0071, right? So you'd have two copies on one, one copy on the other. And at that point, you're just notified that there's a state of transition. You still have access to all the files, but it's just an influx uh, process. And so I know that was a lot to kind of run through in a short amount of time, but um, I'd like to really thank everybody for, you know, feedback and comments and questions, and we'll certainly look forward to catching up uh, tonight over uh, cocktails. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks.